All right, welcome down to Do Go On, where everything is going to be all right. My name is Dave Warnke, and I'm here with two other all righties. One's also a left-handed woman, it's Jess Perkins. <laughs> Hello. And my all righty right-hander, Matt Stewart. Hello, Matt. Hi, Dave. I am all right. You do always say, welcome down to Do Go On. Um, that is because is I have hosted bit... over 1,000 trivia nights with the opening line, welcome down to this week's trivia. That's nice. why. That's but so when weird, you say that... we're on a mezzanine. Yeah, we are currently in an elevated space in a warehouse studio. Yeah, we're floating. But also, it kind of gives the impression that we are inviting our listeners and then our friends into some sort of dungeon, mm. like some sort of dodgy basement, when really we should be saying, welcome up, you know? Cause that... To the attic. Yeah, okay, maybe more like a to like heaven. a rooftop bar. Okay, oh. no, we're not killing people. Okay, I would love to say welcome to the rooftop bar, and it's called Duke On. Yeah, that'd be pretty sick. Anyway, I'd... Cosmos are half price, and Matt Stewart's drinking them all night. <laughs> <laughs> Matty loves a Cosmo. Yeah, you yeah. did accidentally. You didn't accidentally. You ordered a, co- a Cosmo. That's fine. I, I well, a... I mean, the accident was that I I was I probably just wanted a, a water. Sure, but you instead and you said you ordered a seventeen. Cosmo. I'm so easily sold to. I'm the best uh, buyer in in the land. Mm-hmm. And then so she came around. She I was finishing it. It was nice. I'm like, thank you very much. She said, oh, you liked it. Well, we've just in, we've just got a new cocktail on the menu. Are you interested? I'm like, oh, wasn't really going to have anything to drink tonight. And she said, it's it's blue. It's got tequila. In my head, I'm going, I don't like tequila. I don't mm-hmm. like blue. Mm-hmm. And I'm she's a like, green man. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, it's really good. And I said, I'll have one, thank you. <laughs> Did you actually take one? Yeah. And then, and, and then she said, and it's, um, but she hadn't even got to the pitch part, was saying it's on, on a special. It was, it was like four dollars off. I'd already purchased it. So both of us sucked at our jobs there. <laughs> you're, really. the, you're the she kind of guy. Selling. You're the kind of guy and says, we've got some specials tonight. You're like, I'll take them. Yeah. <laughs> All three of them. The soup, the steak, the steak, and the dessert. I'm a vegetarian, but I'll have the steak. You had me at hello. I never said that. Whatever. You had me at hello. <laughs> I know that doesn't really make any sense. All right. Great. What have you guys been up to? I had a cocktail on the weekend, I will say. Did it you? was a... Um, I didn't get it at the time. Uh, it was called a simian sling. Okay. Simeon's you know, like a monkey? I didn't think of that at the time, but then it came out in like a, a coconut thing with a little monkey hanging off it. Oh my god, so cute! It, it was a really little cute. monkey. Well, like a little plastic one. Yeah, no shit. I didn't think it had an actual monkey on <laughs> an it. An actual Simeon. So you pay $17 for a cocktail, but it comes with a free monkey. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is good. That's good value. Matt would say yes. Yeah. You have to look after it forever. You had me at monkey. <laughs> Monkeys could cost upwards of $20. <laughs> you had so had it's me a bargain. It's an absolute bargain. <laughs> you had me at, would you like a... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, whatever. You're offering something, I'll take it. <laughs> yes, I would. Jess, when was the last time you had a cocktail? Talk us through the situation. It's become that. I had a cocktail on tour in New South Wales, actually. We went to a Mexican restaurant and they had um, frozen margaritas that were on. They were like $10 happy hour or something like that. So we had these, uh, Ursula Carlson and I were both like, um, strawberry margarita, thank you. And it was delicious. It was great. Ten dollars. Little, little name drop there too. Is well, that what you're sounds... smirking at? No, no. I was just. Oh. I mean, you had no regret. That's not what cocktails are about. Well, yeah. There, you're right. It just sounded like a pleasant experience to you. It was. <laughs> Dave had a monkey accidentally. Yeah, well, I, I'm still looking after him. His name's Paul Pas- Pasquale. Yeah, Paul Pasquale. Oh <laughs> Paul Pasquale. PP. PP. Little PP. Paul Pasquale. Pee-pee. He's under the table. He hasn't said his first word yet. He, he keeps, is a monkey. He keeps sucking on my leg. He bites me a little bit. <laughs> sucking on my leg. All oh, right. Okay. As he was taught. <laughs> PP. And, and so far, you haven't found an easy segue in today's topic. Which I'm is really trying. <laughs> well, how about I just tell everyone that this is the show where we do a report on a topic. I hope it's cocktails because I, I, I do like them, even though Matt finds them regretful. Well, prepare to be disappointed. Yes, we're all going to be disappointed, Matt. <laughs> Not just you with your <laughs> alcohol choices. Look, Hooray. I'll have a mojito. Stop. Bugging me. Oh, I love a mojito. I'll take it. All right. So, yeah, it is my turn to present a report, and we always start with a question. Yes. Okay, gentlemen. So, my question for you today mm-hmm. is who is the most iconic TV presenter Daryl Summers. in history? <laughs> Daryl <Darryl> Summers. Daryl <laughs> Summers. It's very, very good yeah. Australian rep. Uh, Ernie Dingo. Ernie Dingo. And another Australian one. one there. On Getaway. We are, um, um, uh, David Letterman. Okay. Oh. Uh, 
Would you call him? Yeah, I guess he's a presenter. That's a, that's a good one. It, it, not Australian, also not American. Oh, okay. Uh, Paul Pasquale. Paul Pasquale it is. <laughs> the monkey hour. Our episode of Paul Pasquale. What else have we got? New Zealand, that guy that got sent away for being a racist from morning TV in Australia, that Kiwi guy. Oh, please elaborate. I don't remember that. He was like a super crazy racist guy. Okay. And they paid him a lot of money to come over to do Australian morning TV and just did not rate very well. Which Wait. is weird in such a racist country, but <laughs> people, was... we did not get on board him. We did not get on board I think him. His name might have been Paul something. Pasquale? Pasquale. Maybe, uh, <laughs> Pas- Pasquale? Simeon on the brain. Mm, yeah. um, oh, uh, Louis Theroux. Oh, good oh. one. Uh, correct uh, nationality. Okay. I think. Oh. Yeah. That's... Okay, it just hit me. Yeah. It's got to be the great man. The great man? The one, the only, the 90 year old man, David Attenborough, am I right? David Attenborough. Sir David Attenborough. Sir David Attenborough. Uh, do you say Attenborough or Attenborough? I say Edinburgh. I'll probably pronounce it different ways throughout the episode. But I think if I'm talking casually, I'll say David Attenborough. Yeah, sure. To my friends. Because I'm lazy. David Attenborough. Attenborough, Attenborough. I think. So this one... Richard Attenborough. Richard Attenborough. I'm just trying to practice. This one was uh, suggested by uh, by our good friend and listener, Andy Matthews. Oh, thank you very much, Andy. What is it? At Stupid Old Andy. Correct. At Stupid Old Andy on Twitter. Okay, so he's English. Oh, Jesus. He's 90-something. He's David Attenborough. (laughs) It's, this is genuinely on the tip of my tongue. Uh huh. You take your time, buddy. Hate to hate to rush you. Is it? Mm-hmm. I can almost certainly say it's no. <laughs> to whatever you can say. No. He's going to say Dallas Summers again. <laughs> is it Richard Attenborough? Close. So close. Oh. So close. Fuck. It's his brother David. Okay. Okay. Right. Well, I feel like that was not a bad guess. Very good guess. I mean, with the limited information I had at my I'm, fingertips. I'm going to tell you that I'm really excited about this. Are you going to talk about his brother at all? A little bit. A little bit. Because what a successful family, but I'll let you talk about that. But it is my... But, you know, like, if I was to present a topic of Dave Warnicky and I suddenly started talking a lot about your sister, you'd be like, what the fuck? Hmm. You know? But if she won an Academy Award, maybe. No, but you could mention that. But not like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. not change the but whole was, thing to be about her, you know? But possibly you talk about them growing up or whatever. So yes, I'm really excited. Richard will be mentioned. I mean, Richard did bring back dinosaurs as well. Richard did do that. <sighs> that so. was really cool. I mean, is that anything? Come on, mate. But I want to have a bit of a look at, um, at the life and work of David Attenborough, if I may. If you will indulge me. Please. David Attenborough. <laughs> <laughs> You're an idiot. Okay, so David Frederick Attenborough. Oh, I like that. Was born on the eighth of May, nineteen twenty-six, in West London. Um, but he grew up in uh, in col- on the college house on the campus of the University College in Leicester because his father Frederick was a was a principal there. So he grew up around a university. Um, he's the middle of three sons. His eldest brother Richard became an actor and director. Okay, it's a happy day. In the first couple of minutes, he's he's mentioned. Oh man, I'm excited. My, uh, would you say most famous for Jurassic Park? That'd be the probably that the big one from today's generation. You said he won an Academy Award, which must yeah, have been yeah, uh, Gandhi. You know the film Ga- about Gandhi? oh yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, he directed, oh, director, he directed, directed right. that, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture. Yes. Sorry, which is quite a feat. And Gandhi, and that was played by that English fella, right? Yes. What is his name? Uh, uh, he played Crazy Bastard or something. No, he was in a movie called Yeah. And he's uh, what's his fucking name? And we watched it. We, you know, the, did you ever have this situation in high school where um, you'd have a fill-in teacher for a while? Mm-hmm. We had one and different ones because a teacher was away for the week. So we had, every day was a different feeling teacher. And so they have, so, to, so they that, have to start again every time, don't they? And and there that week we were watching Gandhi and then we we're going to do some work about it. So every day the te- we'd rewind <laughs> back to 10 minutes into the movie and just watch it over and over. And it was the teachers were confused as to why everyone thought Gandhi was so funny. <laughs> yeah. Why do you know all the words? <laughs> Kids are doing and, and, I, and so we and then we saw the so we ended up watching the end over and over and then people were saying when he gets shot he he goes Ben Kingsley's you know? Ben there we Kingsley. go well done he when he gets he gets shot he, he um, goes spoilers oh no <laughs> just sort of like that just really calmly and which is so Gandhi it's very Gandhi but um it became a catchphrase around the uh, quadrangle if everyone would say that yeah. oh no if there was ever like if anyone was hit with a brandy ball or whatever yep. is that or a shot? Yeah, 
you knew what to say. Seems like uh, oh, no. seems like some Dave Warnicky. Oh no no no! <laughs> yeah, but in slow mo. Oh, oh no, no, no no no! I wonder if I'm remembering that right. Anyway, hopefully, pretty relevant. So Richard obviously was a, an actor and director, as we've we've. I was going to say touched on, but talked ex- talked a lot about. Um, Great. Look, I'm happy. We've filled the quote. Don't mention him again. Well, no, he comes back again. But anyway. No, nope, I'm over him. Their youngest brother, John. Uh, oh, now you're talking. Was an executive at uh, Alfa Romeo, the oh. Italian car manufacturer. So they're... Um, so like, exe- like you know, some sort of high up. Yeah, yeah, yeah quite high up in the uh, in that company. What so a fam. Frederick? They're quite a fam. And Mrs. Attenborough, I imagine, was a... Yep, they marry some. There is some good, some good boys. Done a great job. Now, from a really early age, um, David spent his childhood collecting fossils, stones, and other natural specimen. Um, he is interesting little fun fact. He received encouragement for his efforts at the age of seven when a young Jaquetta Hawk admired his museum. Now she was a British archaeologist and writer. I thought it was a type of hawk. Hawk? No. It's, yeah, a hawk it's came a down and said, "This is pretty good <laughs> stuff. Pretty good stuff. You should keep this up." No, she was a British archaeologist and writer, and the daughter of Nobel Prize-winning scientist Sir Frederick Gowland Hopkins, who won the Nobel Prize in 1929 for the discovery of vitamins. Isn't that cool? Wow. Yeah, some things you forget had to be discovered. Yeah, you just accept it. He discovered vitamins. Before that, we didn't really have a concept of vitamins. Wow. Or vitamins. uh, He probably probably wasn't even a rich man, and now that's a multi-billion dollar industry. It's a multivitamin kind of industry. (laughs) (laughs) She did it. (laughs) She did it. Now, he also, uh, David also spent a considerable amount of his time in the grounds of the university. And at age 11, he heard that the zoology department needed a large supply of newts for one of their studies. Newts? Newt Gangridge? Newt, uh, who was the old, the guy who ran for presidency in America? Newt Gingrich? Newt, no, all right, great. Lots of newts. I thought I was going to have more than that. Newt did you say Newt? All right. I said Newt. All right. I'm. I am gonna do give myself a little bit of time in the quiet corner. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the zoology department need Newts for sort of their study. So he offered via his father. He said, "Oh, Dad, tell them I can. I can give them some. I can supply them with the Newts that they need for um, what then was like three penny, three penny a Newt." So he was like, "Oh, you know, I'll I'll supply oh, it's you." Like a little business. Yeah, I'll supply you with the newts that you need, but mm. you got to you got to pay me. And they were like, "Yeah, that's fine, whatever." But what the department didn't know at the time was that David was getting the newts from a pond at the university that was about five meters away from the <laughs> <laughs> from where the the department was. So they could have gotten them themselves. Yeah, they could have just gone out there, but he, he went and did it instead, which I think is genius. That's very good. Absolutely. What a little what a little cheekster. Is that a thing? A cheekster? Probably not. Is now cheekster. Um, in 1936, so David was 10, his brother, he and his brother Richard, there he is, hey, mm-hmm. they attended a lecture by Grey Owl, who was a Canadian conservationist. Um, I thought it was going to be an owl. <laughs> <laughs> I keep disappointing you today. Um, they were really influenced by his advocacy for um, conservation. Now, Grey Owl was a First Nation man who, they're like the Aboriginal people of Canada. Um, and according to Richard... David was bowled over by the man's determination to save the beaver, by his profound knowledge of the flora and fauna of the Canadian wilderness, and by his warnings of ecological disasters should the delicate balance between them be destroyed. I have no qualms in saying that I'm a big fan of the beaver. Big, big fan. If you ever see beavers, they are an amazing looking thing. <laughs> I genuinely. If, do you, have you couldn't even keep a straight face. Though. Have you ever Google image searched a beaver? <laughs> Can you stop? No, but that'd be really because they're a really really cute animal. A be, a be, seriously, they are actually so adorable. Then you would probably also enjoy this this lecture by Grey Owl because he was really into um. He's into the beaver. Into the beaver. You're the worst. So then Richard goes on to say that the idea that mankind was endangering nature by recklessly despoiling and plundering its riches was unheard of at the time. Um, right, so he's the first one to care about the beaver. The he's first one to sort of kick, notice that humans are, are really thing. killing the world. And, so, and this is what, in the 19... 1936, so he's 10 oh, wow. years old. And that's still, like, if you see his work now, that's still largely what he Absolutely. talks about now. Um, which is pretty cool, right? So, um, you know, this uh, Grey Hour was probably really influential to both of them because in 1999, Richard directed a biopic um, of him entitled Grey Hour. So both boys were really impressed and inspired by him, which is... 
pretty cool. That is cool. Except... Oh, no. Um, What's the except? When Grey Owl died two years after the boys saw him speak, so 1938... Oh, right, yep. Doubts about his First Nation identity had been circulating and uh, and stories were published immediately after his death. Um, so, for example, the North Bay Nugget newspaper ran the first expose the day of his death, mm. a story which had been holding for three years. So, basically, they're saying he's he's not actually part of that tribe of people. Right. He, he, Grey Owl was a name he chose for himself. It was, it was like, false. And, uh, and his name was actually uh, Archibald Bellamy. He was born in the UK and emigrated to Canada when he was 18. Right, so he wasn't Indigenous to Canada. He wasn't Indigenous to Canada. But his popularity and support for his causes led, to, uh, led the Ottawa Citizen, which I think is another newspaper, to conclude, of course, the value of his work is not jeopardised. Yeah, of course. He's got a great message. Yeah, absolutely. And all the work that he did and everything. Um, and that was pretty widely shared in the UK press as well. It was like, well, he, you know. Oh, good bloke still. Not, yeah, it may not have been entirely above board, but uh, all of his work still. Do, do, you, do you get the feeling that uh, the biopic that Richard Attenborough made would have mentioned all this controversy? Yeah, I don't know, or, maybe. Or do you think that... He portrayed him just as the man he said he was. The hero, yeah, I don't know. You can speak, Matt. I know you've put yourself in the, the quiet corner, but you're allowed to speak. Yeah. Just thinking about Grey Owl and the Beaver. Hmm. Boy. That's what, I mean... Grey Owl loved the Beaver. No, 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 <laughs> Jess. No, 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 no. I'm just thinking about, the, the, like, yeah, is that a, is that enough to do good work to be, like, pretty like that's pretty fucked to do that i'm brushing over it like i'm sure it was probably not completely i mean he he helps he helped out some animals is that enough to like i think he did a lot more than that i'm just sort of mentioning what a weird so yeah it just seems like how do you it feels like the kind of thing you just get caught in a lie yeah you tell someone at the bank and then one day you're like fuck everyone thinks this now but why are you telling people things at the bank I don't talk to people at the bank. Yeah, Dave. It was a different was... time, 1936. That's true. It was people a different time. People used to chat at the bank. Speaking of that different time. Um, so David Attenborough was educated at, this is like the most uh, like posh sounding boys school. It, probably, it might not be, but it sounds pretty. Um, it's the Wigaston Grammar School for Boys. Oh, Wigaston. Wigaston. It was in Leicester. And then he won a scholarship to Clare College in Cambridge Uh in 1945, where he studied geology and zoology and obtained a degree in natural sciences, which is pretty cool. Um, and in, but in 1947, he was called up for national service in the Royal Navy and spent two years stationed in North Wales and in Scotland. So um, he went off and did his, uh, his Navy service. Probably pretty lucky that the Second World War had just finished. It was a lot less dangerous time to be called up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> now, after leaving the Navy, Attenborough took a position editing children's science textbooks for a publishing company. Just edit- wow, okay. editing? Wow, Yeah, editing um, textbooks. And obviously, he's, he's into science and he's got that degree. So, um, that's kind of up his alley. But he kind of he became quite bored with the work. And in 1950, he applied for a job as a radio talk producer for the BBC. And although he was rejected for this job... His CV later attracted the interest of Mary Adams, who was a head of talks at the talks department of the BBC. So the talks is just like any it's like factual and stuff, isn't yeah, it? factual broadcasting is sort of how they describe it. Um, so she was the head of the of the talks department for the BBC. Um, oh, sorry, for the BBC's television service. So he's, right, applied, so he's applied for radio. He's applied for a radio job. He didn't get that job, but he's attracted her attention for TV and and the BBC's. TV service wasn't doing that well. And it's probably pretty early on, wasn't it? Do you say 1950? Yeah. So it's, it's early and it's... Early days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Attenborough, like most Britons at, at the time, didn't own a television and he hadn't, he'd only seen like one television program in his life. So <laughs> And now I'm going to make television. Well, you're absolutely right in that TV was starting. It was just sort of starting out. And that show he'd seen was Leave It to Beaver <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Matt's back. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs> right, so even though he hadn't really seen much TV, didn't even own a TV, he accepted the offer of a three-month training course. And also in that year, he married Jane Elizabeth Ebsworth Oriel, which is fantastic. fantastic name. I, I assume he married her on, the, on her name. Yeah, well, I mean, who were, you, who were you choosing based on their name a couple of weeks ago? There was somebody whose name you were like, yeah, I'd marry that. 
Do you remember that? Was it uh, Love Ring? Yes, it was. It was Love Ring. Something Love Ring. Clara? Clara, who was involved with H.H. Holmes, Holmes a very, very, very dangerous man. Oh, Love Ring. And you're like, yeah, Love Ring, for sure. I'd marry her for her name, you creep. Um, In 1952, he joined the BBC full-time. So originally he was just kind of doing a little bit of work. He joined them full-time. Initially, he was discouraged from appearing on TV, like actually on camera, because Adams thought his teeth were too big. (laughs) She's like, How do you bring that up for someone? you got a weird hi, look. Hi, can I go on the TV? No, no, your teeth are too big. Get back behind the camera. Well, you know TV's all about you know image and stuff like yeah. that. It's all about teeth size. It's all about teeth size. Your smile is too big. Hi. This is a serious business. I think your teeth are just the right size, Jess. Do, but... do you reckon? Matt, what do you think of my teeth? Probably you could knock off a couple of mil. Do you reckon? I reckon. Yes, chisel them down. Yeah. That's what... It, the, Industry people do. They chisel their teeth. Okay. He sort of talks with his mouth closed a bit, doesn't he? Does the I can't say I've noticed his teeth. Turtle. Do you think that he's trying to hide his teeth? Yeah, I think he's hiding his he's teeth. He's a teeth hider. Oh, yeah. No, because of her. she put. Maybe he used to be really yeah. smiley and she's kind of ruined that for him. Oh, that's that's probably pr- created right his amazing voice, though. That's mm. true. Because that's it was true. like, hello, everyone. I got my teeth out. No, He'd instead like, it's, Ugh. here we find the Dave Warner key. Mm. 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 Watches he blinks. <laughs> I don't know why I said blinks. That's good commentary. You are nailing. I'm pretty good. I do a pretty good Edinburgh. Yeah. Sit and blink. Look at him go. Watch Sit he and... sheds his skin. At this time of year, the Warnocky sheds three layers of skin and runs around <laughs> naked. This is part of their mating ritual, and it is very rarely successful. <laughs> Dave, if you could please, put, put your back please. <laughs> There's the meeting call. Please. <laughs> no, it's more like go on, go, oh, go on, go on, please, please. Oh, that's, that's You're not enjoying that, Matt. Okay. No, I just, just interesting. It's a bit, it feels a bit sad. It well, feels na- too, nature, it feels too often, real. It feels nature too real is to me. Sad. Oh, fuck off! That's the meanest part. It feels too real. <laughs> It's definitely not real. Dave's a beautiful man. Certainly am. Anywho. Perfect size teeth. So David Edinburgh has teeth that are too big. So we're not going to put him on camera. So instead he becomes a producer for the talks department. Well, they should have put him in the radio department. That way you ne- make sure they never get on camera. Face for radio. Exactly. Oh. But no, he's behind the scenes. He's a, he's a producer for the talks department, um, which as we sort of mentioned before, handles like non-fiction broadcasts, basically. So cool. it's all factual kind of stuff. Um now, his association with natural history programs began when he produced and presented a three-part series called Animal Patterns, and it was like a studio-bound program. So it was all shot in a studio, and it featured animals from London Zoo with the naturalist Julian Huxley discussing their use of camouflage, self-defence, and like courtship display, sort of like the Dave Warnicky mating ritual. Right, right. So they, what, they bring in the bird or the... Yeah. I don't know. I imagine it's not the rhino, but yeah, well, bring I, in the bird. I mean, that's why it's kind of interesting because it does say it's a stu- bring in the jacketta hawk. <laughs> bring her in because it it says it's a studio bound program. So yeah, it would be must be sort of smaller. Right. But animals, I guess. Do you say he's presenting this? Yeah. So they're giving him a go. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, is he wearing some sort presented, of? So. wearing some sort of device to cover his mouth. Fake teeth. Yeah, he's wearing he's wearing a gas mask at all yeah. times. <laughs> it's very strange. Yeah. They never explain it. Well, you know. People just kind of accepted it. Now, through this program, Animal Patterns, that he was uh, he was working on, Attenborough met Jack Lester, who was a curator for the zoo's reptile house. And uh, they decided to make a series about an animal collecting expedition. Um, and the result was a show called Zoo Quest, which first broadcast in 1954. <laughs> Zoo Quest! Zoo Quest is pretty cool, I That's reckon. a fantastic name. Yeah. Now, um... He became, Admiral became the presenter of this one as well at short notice because uh, Jack Lester was really sick. Right, so his teeth were His teeth were fine, out. but his like, kidneys weren't. Like, he was sick, I don't know. <laughs> he, he was ill, so David Attenborough stepped in and he was the presenter for the series. Um, so that's kind of, uh, like, those two shows are sort of the start of his, his work with um, natural history programs, which is kind of cool. Um, in 1957, the BBC Natural History Unit was formally established in Bristol, and Attenborough was asked to join it, but he declined because he didn't want to move from London where he and his young family were settled because by this stage he and Jane had a couple of kids. They've had um, Robert and Susan, so he doesn't want to move his kids, so he's like, no, I'm not going to – I'll have to stay here, which, yep. is, which is nice. He's a family man. <laughs> that is nice. You're so quiet. You can talk. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying you have to, but – 
Um, quick, think of something. No, quick. that's fine. I'm just um, worried. That, are you okay? Um, I've hit a wall. Okay, sure, sure, that's fine. Well, do what you got to do. I'll bounce back. Yeah, I know you will, buddy. Um, so instead of moving to be part of the Natural History Unit, he instead formed his own department, which was the Travel and Exploration Unit. Uh, much cooler name. Much cooler, but also I imagine the Travel and Exploration Unit has to leave London away from his family. Probably a lot more than the other unit. He did not think that through. Yeah. I don't want to travel, but I'm setting up the travel Well, no, department. but like that way at least the family stays where they are and he can just travel around, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, I don't care about it. No, but like he's not—he's not uprooting the whole family, making the kids move. They stay there, and that makes he sense. goes travelling. That, that does, does make, make sense. Um, we Best tease, of both worlds. but he knows. No. I can't believe that I was second guessing David Attenborough. How dare you? Even in the nineteen fifties. God. So that uh, that did sort of allow him to continue to present ZooQuest as well as produce other documentaries. <laughs> Fantastic. We've got to talk Zoo about that. ZooQuest. I think it's it great. It sounds like a like a board game. Yeah, it does a bit. Sounds a bit like Jumanji. Yeah, Another yeah. name for Jumanji. Jumanji. But you've got to like collect. I know, but it feels like you've got to go on safari and like I don't know, <laughs> c- capture animals for the zoo. Well, it's a it's a show about collecting animals for the zoo. So yeah, I guess I what guess it's an appropriate time. name. Yeah. They still do that. Not catching them, but like. It's just now they just the zoo animals all just came in on, of their own accord, right? Yeah, they, they have like, they have one door, like a one way door. <laughs> somewhere, leave it so open. Oh no! Yeah. You can you can, you can come, come but you can never leave. They walk in and go, oh, shit. I left my phone out there. Oh, God. This can, is if I could just, I'll come back in. I just left my Promise. My girlfriend's oh. out there. Can I just go see her quickly? I just no. need to give her, get my phone off her. No. Get in the penguin enclosure. Doesn't work for prison, does it? It doesn't work for the zoo. Because the zoo is a prison for animals. <gasps> I never thought of it like that before. You heard it here first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So he was working on that for a while, and then in the early 60s, he resigned from the permanent staff of the BBC to study uh, for a postgraduate degree in degree in social anthropology at the London School of Economics, uh-huh. um, interweaving his study with uh, with further filming. Oh, so he's still presenting? Uh, yes, I think so. So he's doing like a little bit, but um, he he's re- resigned from the full-time permanent staff. So he might just still kind of do a few things, but... Um, he's freelance now. Yeah, he's kind of yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. However, he accepted an invitation to return to the BBC as controller of BBC Two before he could finish the degree. Controller. Controller. That sounds very high up. By by looking at it, I think it's sort of like a an executive producer, or he's like at the in charge of, of the whole channel, right? Well, it's uh, mate. Yes. Let's Is he say like, yes. like the remote controller, but he's the one who's at the station. So whenever you think the fat controller, fat controller, <laughs> not the remote controller. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Fat controller. Fat controller. He's the one um, who changes the channels. Mm-hmm. That, and then that'd be remote controller. Remote controller. And then Jesus. the fact controller is the one that um, turns the volume up. Yep. Thought so. Yeah. Great. Was that worth? Is that worth putting in there? Hey. Eh? It's all making sense. Is Look that worth it. contributing to the conversation? Well, to be honest, if you were there for me. And if this was a team game, you would have turned that into something great. This has never been a team game, mate. <gasps> so I, I think I'm imagining that he's like some sort of director. It's, yeah, it seems to be quite like a. I would almost say like an executive producer sort of thing, like overseeing a but lot the of whole ch- the channel rather than a, it, a TV it, show. Yeah, which exactly. Is, Amazing. Yeah, so that's for BBC Two. So what year are we up to? That's in uh, 1965. He became the controller of BBC Two, but he had a clause inserted into his contract that would allow him to continue making programs on an occasional basis. So he's still kind of like on the business side, but also like he can he can be writing stuff and working on programs because that's what he really loves to do. That's cool. Yeah, and he must have been pretty good if they were like, yeah, well, he did that. Exactly. And later in the same year, he helped film Elephants in Tanzania. Um, you know, like uh, this is all sorts of projects that he got to do while he was a uh, controller. Like in in 1969, he made a three part series on the cultural history of Bali. Um, like so, he's he's working on all sorts of different things, which is pretty cool. And although BBC Two was actually launched the year before in 1964, it had really struggled to capture the public's attention. Like it it was struggling; it wasn't doing very well. So when Attenborough arrived as controller, um, he quickly shook up the schedule. He was like. He came in, just made some changes. He's like, I'm going to fuck shit up. I am burning everyone. <laughs> you're, all, you're all fired. You're fired. I am BBC Two, and I'll make every show. It's amazing. They had, they, their national broadcast had a second channel about 50 years before Australia did. Amazing. 
Yeah. It's pretty... Um, I mean, their population probably demands it. Whereas ours so it does, it does make sense. So yeah. he, he wanted to make BBC Two's output diverse and different from that offered by other networks. So he began to establish a portfolio of programs that would go on to basically define the channel's identity for decades to come. Right. And so he made some huge changes, which was, um, which was really cool. So... Um, he he introduced like music, the arts, entertainment, archaeology, experimental comedy, travel, drama, sport, business, science, and natural history. They all had a place in the weekly schedule on BBC Two. Yeah, but, but I was say, before that, they just had they a camera a, on the roof of the building. There was no entertainment. <laughs> he introduced entertainment yeah, to they, TV. Hey guys, how about we uh, replace that one show with several others about different topics, <laughs> no, ranging in interest and age groups? It'll never work, Attenborough. You're Attenborough. a madman. <laughs> You're crazy. You're fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. I like that Let's hey. give it a go. Let's give it a go. Oh, God. So, it, yeah, it did do... Um, Apparently sport is popular, okay? <laughs> we'll find out, won't we? We won't. We will find out. <laughs> We're in my teeth. I've lost my teeth. I'm perfect for television. I'm perfect. <laughs> i got no teeth. i got no teeth. Chiseled them down to dust. I chiseled them down. They said they were too big, now they're gone. <laughs> Learn from my mistakes, David. <laughs> my mistakes. Learn from my mistakes. This character you've created. I'm just imagining he's the janitor, but still <laughs> he thinks he knows more than the, the director of the Because he used BBC. to be a controller, yeah. now he's he used just to be a janitor controller. there. Now I clean the John. <laughs> <laughs> With my teeth. Oh. That's where they're gone. Oh, Dave, no. <laughs> it was funny until you went there. No, I think when he said John's, he meant uh, <laughs> Richard and David's younger brother. <laughs> I clean John. I clean you with my teeth. Just yeah. scraping off Stop grime. It. Scraping grime off with my teeth. Yuck. Uh, That's enough. Stop, please. It was a grotty Stop time. Stop it. Okay. Yuck. Okay. <clears throat> Back to BBC Two and shaking things up. Shaking it up. So programs he commissioned included um, Man Alive, Call My Bluff, maybe one that we've already spoken about before, such as Monty Python's Flying Circus. What? What? Yeah, yeah so, so he commissioned. I mean, that's really cool, isn't it? Yeah, isn't that kind of interesting? He gave them a go. Yeah, and so um, and it was really weird. That would have been part of the experimental comedy section, I, I would assume. Yep, because they were a little bit different. Um, now BBC Two later became the first British channel to broadcast in colour. That was in 1967. Did David make that choice? I don't. I were like, this won't catch on. <laughs> I don't know. If People he, like black and white. I don't know like if he it. made the choice, but he did. Um, he took advantage of it by he introduced televised snooker, <laughs> as well as bringing rugby league to British television on a regular basis. Uh, both still very popular in England. Yeah, so he he was. You know, he knew what he was doing. He was Col- good at his job. Snooker would have been hard in black and white, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah true. It's all coloured. Coloured balls. It's all coloured, yeah. So that would it's be all coloured. It's just colours. There's about 16 colours. Name them, Jess. <laughs> so call Not again. To, call Not back again. to last week's episode where I tried to name 16 colours. And did it successfully, and may I mind you. Did it in record time. <laughs> I think you'll find it was the world record for the fastest time to name 16 I separate colours. nailed it, so wow. you're welcome. It only took 49 seconds. <laughs> uh. Duh. <laughs> One of his most significant decisions was to order a 13-part series on the... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That was very funny. 13-part series. I get it as... A... What are you talking about, Dave? For some reason you've lost my... it. <laughs> I thought you were going to say... One of his uh, most successful things was ordering a 13-course meal... <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> there was pasta. There was pizza. Okay, Dave. Name, them. name 13 courses. <laughs> All right. You come out. You go in there. There's a canapé. Mm-hmm. Some sort of hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> uh, second hors d'oeuvre. Garlic bread is there. Jeez, you've uh, gone vague early. Some sort of... You, you, want, you couldn't even name one, let alone 13. Some Keep sort going. of hors d'oeuve. Uh, All right, we've got garlic bread. It's up to uh, two. Followed up by sushi, as it always is. Sushi next, sure. We're back to Italy with pizza. Sure, four. There's a roast. <laughs> yep, five. There's, a, there's a chicken. Obviously. Not roast, boiled, so different, six. Yuck. Um, there's an egg dish. Uh-huh. An egg dish? <laughs> what kind of egg dish? Look, what am I? A master chef? Fuck. <laughs> oh, it's a seven. Uh, there's a. Everyone takes a break and has a glass of sangria. <laughs> No, that's not even a course. Uh, oh, yeah, your but they eat it with a spoon, so it's like a soup. Okay. It's a thick sangria. Thick sangria. You have to eight. Fucking hell. How many did I promise? 13. 13. Um, of course, then there's time for... <laughs> I can't even think of things that eat. Uh, baked potatoes. Sure, baked potatoes. Uh, spring rolls. Spring rolls. 
you just think you're pretty with <laughs> I really, really am. What did I eat today? What did I eat? Uh, churros comes out. Churros? Have one of those for lunch. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, I ate that for lunch. Um, there's got... a Greek yogurt. <laughs> followed, followed by a normal yogurt. Just in case. <laughs> Wow, he did it. That ain't kidding. And that is what put David Attenborough on the map. <laughs> Greek yogurt followed by a normal yogurt. Yeah. Oh. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Thank you. And that only took three minutes and seven seconds. <laughs> record time. We break records every week here. <laughs> For most bullshit yeah. spam. Yeah. Name 13 dishes. Go. Imagine if you just said that on the street. <laughs> oh. oh, man, I'd love to do an interview show. Name 13 dishes. Um, Easy, no problem. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm I'm so sorry to disappoint you with the, the rest of my sentence. Then. Okay. So what did he order? Thirteen. <laughs> Thirteen part series. Oh, that makes much more sense. Yeah, because he works in television. Oh, not in food. He's not a caterer. <laughs> Thirteen part series on the history of Western art. Um, and kind of the idea of that was to show off the quality of the new UHF colour television service that right, BBC, Two, BBC Two offered. That sounds like a very ambitious show. The history of Western art, even in thirteen episodes, that's pretty. It, it was pretty ambitious. Really successful, and people loved it. Did they? Yeah, it was broadcast to universal acclaim. It was in nineteen sixty nine that they uh, that they did it, and it was called Civilization. And it kind of set. Uh, I like the way this is worded. It set the blueprint for author documentaries. So it was sort of like this is like it, it was revolutionary in a way. Oh, was he the host as well? I don't know. No, I don't think he was the host. No. Um Right, but he's devised it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a and guy. he's he's um he he sort of commissioned that series and, and made it happen. So, um that's kind of cool. Um so Edinburgh also thought that the the story of evolution would be uh would be a good topic for, to, for to, such ta- a series. to tackle in a one part episode <laughs> for, for a series. <laughs> Um, so he shared his idea with a guy called Chris Parsons, who was a producer at the uh, Natural History Unit, who came up with the title Life on Earth, and he returned to Bristol to start planning the series. And uh, David Attenborough was like, he really, he harboured this strong desire to present this series himself. He wanted to be the presenter, but like he wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible so long as he remained in a management position. He couldn't really, like then it's sort of like, I'm so running the show, I'm on the show, yeah, so I am a, the show. He's allowed to have little breaks, but it's just like a massive, yeah. probably like takes a year to film type and I, thing. Yeah, and I don't think he's really doing a lot of on-camera stuff when we say he's working on the project. I think he's writing a lot of stuff or contributing to shows, but he's not necessarily always the presenter. Cool. Right, so he really wants to, like he, he's really invested in it and he thinks that would be really great, but while he's still, you know, one of the bosses, he can't do it. Bit of a dilemma. Yeah, well, and, and it sort of almost, I guess, in a way got worse because in 1969 he was promoted to Director of Programs, making him responsible for the output of both BBC channels, which is huge, right? Well, Yeah. Um, now, his tasks, which included... I had no idea about any of this side of him. Yeah, I know, right? Like He's, hmm. he's got like a real background in television, like real high up top yeah, executive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A lot of people kind of don't really know that. So when you find out that he studied natural history and stuff at uni, you're like, oh yeah, that yeah, makes that sense. Yeah, that makes sense because look at him now. Exactly. But then he goes, he's, he's sort of working behind the scenes in a lot of TV, which is really interesting. And then okay. if it was about four or five years, he was a hairdresser, which I also <laughs> found surprising. Yeah, that is surprising. And then he was a butcher for a bit, mm. which was weird because of his... Yeah, love of animals. Love of animals, but... Um, hey. Do you, do you, I wonder if he's a vegetarian. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. There wouldn't be that many 90-year-old vegetarians, right? When was it invented? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. You're mm. the veteran vegetarian here. Well, I'm, the, I'm the vet. You tell Went me. Went through many campaigns <laughs> of not eating a certain thing. Mm. Yeah. No, I don't know. Good question, though. I'll, I'll maybe I'll come back with you next week. Mm. Well, we, to the answer to the question, is David Attenborough a vegetarian? Yeah. Great. If only I was somewhere we could find out. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> so with this new job, uh, it, he was sort of a bit more businessy. You know, he was sort of uh, he was in a lot of meetings, board meetings. Had to agree to budgets. Uh, he was <laughs> now sort of <laughs> he had to agree to budgets. Mm-hmm. Oh. He had meetings. You know what it's like. It sounds horrifying. No, but it just meant that he was. Um, he was far removed from the business of filming programs. No, like I can imagine if you've made a documentary about elephants in Tanzania, that's a lot more interesting than going into a business meeting and talking about meeting targets. Yeah, exactly. Even if it is television, that's still the... And his passion... The, it's the business side and he likes animals. Yeah, his passion is, is actually creating the, the film. So 
he, he's got a promotion and that's good, but it's not quite exactly Yeah, I'm sure he's, he's, get, he's probably getting paid quite well. Yeah, but it's not quite what he wants to be doing. So when his name was sort of being thrown around as a candidate for the position of Director General of the BBC in 1972... So is that the absolute top job? It seems to be, yeah. Pretty high up. Man, that's awesome. He phoned his brother Richard and confessed that he had no desire for the job. He's like, I don't want, I don't want that. Um, he wasn't like... It wasn't that he was offered. People were just kind of... His name was sort of being suggested when the when the role was coming up. He's like, I don't want that. Earlier in the following year, he actually left his post to return to full-time program making, which left him free to write and present the planned natural history series that he'd wanted to present. So he got to do it, the Life on Earth series. That, oh, so the one that he was angling to be. Yeah, that he really wanted, but he's like, I can't do it while I'm... Uh, you know, while I'm the big boss. But now he's he's taken a back seat and he's like, I can do the show I want to do, which is lovely. It is lovely. Hey, you guys, you notice how I just popped out to the library for a bit? Mm-hmm. I was just checking about his vegetarian. Oh, let's all go around the table and take a guess. All right. Well, you know the answer now, obviously. <laughs> I reckon he is a meat eater. I reckon he is a vegetarian. Dave is correct. He's a meat eater. He's, a, he's an omnivore. And apparently it's because... Uh, yeah, he thinks, you know, he sees it out in nature. We, he thinks of us as, we, that's how we evolved to be omnivores, so he's an omnivore. Fair enough. He likes meat, basically, and he can't be fucked. Changing his ways, <laughs> stubborn old... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, I want to keep that in so bad. <laughs> Why couldn't I have said something else? <laughs> Can you beep it? <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, that'd be fun. Um, so after his resignation, Attenborough became a freelance broadcaster and immediately started work on his next project, um, which was a prearranged trip to Indonesia with a full crew from the Natural History Unit. It resulted in the 1973 series Eastwards with Attenborough, which was uh, similar in tone to the earlier Zoo Quest show. Like, I just wanted to bring up Zoo Quest. Right, I'm glad it's, it's making a comeback, and it should... Right, so Make another comeback. So Eastwards with Attenborough was that series. And after he came back from that tri- trip, um, he began to work on the scripts for Life on Earth. And due to the scale... Oh, so that hasn't started that yet. That hasn't started yet. It's kind of just a work in progress. Right. Um, due to the scale of his ambition, like this is a big a big project they're taking on, the BBC decided to partner with an American network to secure the necessary funding. And while the negotiations are happening for that, he's working on a number of other TV shows anyway. Like, he's always just working on lots of different projects. Um, so there was one about, like, tribal art, which is called The Tribal Eye, and another one on the voyage... The tribal Eye for the straight guy. <laughs> Exactly, 1975, they were ahead of their time. Um, and there was another one about um, Voyages of Discovery, which is called The Explorers, also in 1975. So he's busy working on other stuff. Um, Explorer's eye for the straight guy. <laughs> Eventually the BBC signed a co-production deal with Turner Broadcasting and Life on Earth moved into production in 1976. Ted Turner? Ted Turner, so that's the CNN guy. The guy that founded CNN? Yes. Yeah, Ted Turner. Yeah, that's right. The first twenty-four hour news network. I did this. I did this report this morning. So <laughs> don't ask too many questions. <laughs> Ted Turner is a billionaire media mogul. But it, but yes. that is the same Turner as uh, d- almost certainly Turner Broadcast. How many Turners could there be? Tina Turner. <laughs> um, uh, Fitter and Turner. <laughs> that always comes up. It's always an answer to a, a list. Fitter and Turner. <laughs> Corner Turner. Uh, Bunsen burner. No, that's not quite the same, is it? You're getting burner better turner. at rhyming, though, which is good. We've been working on that for a few weeks, haven't we? Yeah, we have. We have. <laughs> Page turner. Page oh, turner. now you're back. You're back on, because that one exists. <laughs> <laughs> right, so this is sort of the, the um, beginning of... Uh, of the not the end. Not the beginning of the oh end. Because he's still alive. The beginning of his sort of most well-known body of work, um, which is kind of known as like the Life series, because they all, all, I think they all include the word life in the title. So beginning with Life on Earth in 1979, David Attenborough set about creating a body of work which would become a benchmark of quality in wildlife filmmaking and influenced a generation of documentary filmmakers. So he's... You know, like he's the godfather. He's the godfather of of documentaries, and especially in in wildlife. The series also established many of the hallmarks of the BBC Natural History output. So, 
By treating his subjects seriously and researching the latest discoveries, Attenborough and his production team gained the trust of scientists who responded by allowing him to feature their subjects in his program. So because he knew his shit and did the work and... He's not just some paid actor that says the lines. He respected it so much and was so passionate about it that he sort of had their respect and then that's how he has, you know, such amazing resources that he uses for all of his documentaries, which is really amazing. So, for example, in Rwanda, Attenborough and his crew were granted privileged access to film um, uh, a, a research group of mountain gorillas like that other people would not have access to but the people who were you know using these gorillas as research allowed him to to film them which is amazing um, <clears throat> the success of life on earth prompted the BBC to consider a follow-up and five years later the living planet was screened and this time Attenborough built his series around the theme of ecology and the adaptations of living things to their environment. So it was another critical and commercial success, which generated a huge international sales for, for the BBC. Right, because they can sell it to every network ever. Exactly. So they're, they're doing really well. He's making them a lot of money. And in 1990, the Trials of Life completed the original Life trilogy, looking at animal behaviour through different stages of life. Um, now, it kind of drew some strong reactions from the public because it, uh, it had sequences of killer whales hunting sea lions and chimpanzees hunting and violently killing um, other monkeys. But it was pretty... Like, it was probably... Oh, so that would, yeah, that was new. They pretty didn't graphic. Not, yeah, right. Yeah, what do you mean? But it's, it, or, you know, you shouldn't be showing that. Because that's kind of whole... what you think about. Like, when I think about those kind of shows, it's always a cheetah chasing down an antler or yeah, something. Yeah, an antler. An antler. <laughs> <laughs> Give me that antler. <laughs> Give it to that, me. that is why they chase down those um, antelopes, right? It's because for their antlers. The, yeah. Why the cheetahs do it? Yeah, they to like, sell the antlers. Yeah, yes. they, yeah. they they are they antler make dealers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They're, 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 they're a big market for it. In the it's cheetah how community. How they make a buck, and then they sell that, and then they buy food with the money <laughs> yeah. they make. Yeah. They buy, they yeah buy Quinoa. antelope, and that's why make. David Attenborough eats meat. He sees that <laughs> circle of life, and it makes sense. He gets it. Hey, but, can you beep out earlier when I said? You've already asked. Wait, that. can you do it again then? <laughs> Yes. If it just misses, even better. <laughs> In the 1990s, Attenborough continues, continued to use the Life Strand title for succession of, uh, of some more documentaries. So in 1993, he presented Life in the Freezer, which uh, have, <laughs> have a guess what that one's about. I reckon he, he had a weird turn, obviously, <laughs> and he went down to the supermarket. <laughs> And he just sat, <laughs> sat in there with the he peas for a while. He and peas. It just suddenly hit him. I filmed everything outside. Maybe I'll start filming stuff inside. These peas are on special for $3 for a kilo bag. <laughs> Life in the shower. Yeah, I spend the long time, every day in here. I'll just hook up a camera. Here we go. This is it. No, it was about, um, it was the first television series uh, about the natural history of Antarctica. And although he was part... Really, the first one, a television yeah. series wasn't until the 90s. Yeah. That is wow. incredible. Natural History of Antarctica. And although he was well past uh, the normal retirement age, he was 67 at this time, he then embarked on a number of uh, more specialised uh, surveys of the natural world, beginning with plants. Um, plants proved to be a difficult subject for his producers, who had to deliver five hours of television, featuring what are essentially immobile objects. <laughs> That is. So what do you use bees? That I is an amazing feat. Well, the result is uh, the private life of plants, which is in 1995. <laughs> private life of plants. <laughs> I like it. That everything's just blurred. Well, it's. Well, well, well. Check out that stigmata. Yeah. Stigmata. That's not the right word. I'm not finding words today. What do you What do you call the plant dicks? Mm. What are plant dicks called, Dave? <laughs> I know that. They're word. not stigmata. That's that's the bleeding from the hands of mm. Jesus Christ. It's uh, st- it's something like that though. St- st- anyway, whatever. Stamen. 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 Stamen to that. <laughs> St- Sigmata. Stamen. Saved it. Well done. So, Bright Life of Plants showed plants as uh, dynamic organisms by using time lapse photography to speed up their growth. So that means that they just filmed every every plant you see. They just filmed for like four months. Imagine. Isn't that crazy? How much footage. How long it takes to ingest all that video? Mm. That that would make it interesting viewing. I'd love to see that sped up plants going. That'd yeah, it looks really cool, and the light changes around it, and mm. yeah. yeah, and you can see like you know, they're like vines and stuff like crawling out and oh, it's wrapping amazing. around. Yeah, absolutely amazing. So it's it's um it's well worth it. Um, now next he was uh, prompted by an enthusiastic uh, ornithologist at the BBC Natural History Unit. Um, That's a bird lover. 
Okay, well, that was about to make sense in the next sentence. Thanks, Dave. Attenborough then turned his attention to the animal kingdom and in particular, birds. That's because ornithologists like birds. <laughs> <laughs> it's not related to their name, it's just as a coincidence. Yes, it's amazing. Well, yeah, ornithology is actually the study of ants. This guy just happened to like birds. How did you know? <laughs> I just... Um, so as David Attenborough was neither an obsessive twitcher, which is like a bird a watcher. A nickname for a bird watcher. Uh, and he wasn't a bird expert. He decided... He Ornithologist. Was, <laughs> he was better... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he was better qualified to make The Life of Birds, which came out in 1998, on the theme of behaviour. Because he's, he's not an expert, but he's like, I'm going to just study their behaviour. Um, that documentary series won a Peabody Award the following year, which recognises distinguished work by American radio and television stations. So obviously for its... Broadcast in the States. What, did his documentary about the freezer win a pea body? No. <laughs> Frozen pea body. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. So the Order of the Remaining Life series was dictated by developments in camera technology. So, for example, um, for the Life of Mammals, which is in 2002, low light and infrared cameras were deployed to show the behaviour of nocturnal mammals. And advances in macro photography made it possible to capture natural behaviours of very small creatures for the first time. And in 2005, life in the undergrowth introduced audiences to the world of invertebrates. What are they, Dave? They, they're people who don't like to socialise. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that the camera work of those documentaries is so incredible oh, when you think about remarkable. like the one especially the one that fascinates me is the ones underwater where he's narrate like obviously david attenborough is the face of it he's narrating it done a lot of research an amazing guy How, i always feel that the the camera people don't get enough credit for spending like months yeah. underwater filming it must be so cold also dangerous at yeah. times dark it's abs- yeah i mean they, amazing. I mean, they don't they do feature in the credits. How much credit do you want them to have? They get paid very well, Dave. Do they get not paid ever, well? They're not doing that job to be in the spotlight. They just want to bloody get wet every now and then. <laughs> you know, some people just like moisture. You fucking. We all like to get. It's wet not every all now about. Then. Not everyone wants to be just in the bloody public eye like you, Davey boy. <laughs> Come on, mate. Some people like just to get a little bit damp. <laughs> This is a weird episode. I feel very weird. <laughs> Touch me. I feel weird. <laughs> no, you're all damp. I'm damp all over. I'm all damp. Some of us just like to be that way. <laughs> I showered fully clothed. I like oh, to no. be damp. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm terrified. Okay. <laughs> At this point, um, Attenborough realised that he'd spent 20 years unconsciously assembling a collection of programs on all the major groups of, <laughs> of animals and plants. How do you suddenly realise, hang on, I've done everything. <laughs> hey, are you knocking David Attenborough? No, it's, just, it's, just, it's an amazing realisation. There's a but. Oh. Only uh, reptiles and amphibians were missing. All right, so the... Oh, only two of the largest groups. So he did them. Uh, Life in Cold <laughs> Blood was broadcast in 2008 and he'd completed his whole set... And it was actually brought together in a, like a DVD encyclopedia as well called Life on Land, um, which is pretty cool. He's covered everything now. And um, in an interview that year, he was asked to sum up his achievements and he responded, um, the evolutionary history is finished. The endeavour is complete. If you'd asked me 20 years ago whether we'd be attempting such a mammoth task, I'd have said, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> These programs tell a particular story and I'm sure others will come along and tell it much better than I did. But I do hope that if people watch it in 50 years' time, it will still have something to say about the world we live in. Oh, Isn't David. that nice? That's oh, a lovely man. David. I really like that. I've got uh, a couple of other things that he worked on outside of his life series. Um, so he narrated every episode of Wildlife on One, which is a BBC One wildlife series, which makes sense. It's a wildlife series on BBC One, so they called it Wildlife One. They're pretty creative. Um, it ran for 253 episodes wow. between 1977 and 2005. And at its peak, it drew a weekly audience of 8 to 10 million. That is... Isn't that amazing? A lot. And, and also a long span. Long span. Years. And the 1987 episode, Meerkats United, was voted the best wildlife documentary of all time by BBC viewers. That's pretty cool, isn't it? I love Meerkats. Yeah. Um, and he also narrated over 50 episodes of Natural World, which was a BBC Two flagship wildlife series. So he's just across BBC, like you wouldn't believe. He's like the poster boy. Yeah, he totally is. 
And a guy called Alastair Fothergill, who was a senior producer that Attenborough had worked with um, on The Trials of Life and Life in the Freezer, he was making uh, The Blue Planet, which was the unit's first comprehensive series on marine life. This is one of my favourite sentences that I came across. He decided not to use an on-screen presenter due to difficulties in speaking on camera through diving apparatus. <laughs> 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 I love that. But the big advantage, you couldn't see his teeth. <laughs> yeah, couldn't yeah. not see his teeth. So but David Attenborough, uh, he was asked to narrate the films, which I think is probably a better <laughs> idea than having somebody on. on <laughs> 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 oh, yes, I do do that noise very well. Thank you. Yes. That. <clears throat> Some would say you possibly picked this whole topic hmm. to... Uh, Showcase that skill. Correct. <laughs> um, some other work that uh, that he's been a part of. From 1983, Attenborough worked on two environmentally themed musicals. What? <laughs> With the WWF and writers Peter Rosen and Conlon. Um, yeah, so there was one about the Amazon rainforest and the second was called Ocean World, which uh, premiered in 1991. There's a couple of musicals that he worked on there. It was pretty Ocean cool. Ocean World. Is this fun facts? Uh, it's kind of leading into fun facts. I have a section because called fun facts, but all of this is pretty fun from now right, on. Right, I just wanted to say, because you did promise them last week. Yeah, and I am kind of, I, I'm getting towards the end here. I wanted to mention some of his awards and then I've got a couple of fun facts. Okay, great. I'm, I'm excited, Matt. All right. Room for fun Is that facts? okay, I'm Matt? In, yes. So awards, firstly, or awards and uh, and uh, recognitions by twenty uh, January twenty thirteen, Attenborough had collected thirty two honorary degrees from British universities. Thirty two more than any other person. Oh, so, wow, thirty two honorary degrees. I I like how, they're, they're how listed. Genuine? They're listed on the internet. I'm not going to read them all out because that's ridiculous. That's absolutely... Imagine, 32. Oh, his study must be full. Does, mm -hmm. When you're honorary, that that means they just go, come to this barbecue we're having and we're going to give you a piece of paper? Or do you have to do anything for that? You it's, have to have achieved something in a... Yeah. Hopefully in that field. It's not just come to a barbecue. Right, okay. Jesus Christ. But you don't have to... Just because you've already time, done it. You've, you've happened to have done it and they'll invite you in. Just because yeah. every time we have a barbecue and I give you a little certificate... <laughs> yeah, I just thought that might have been how it worked. That's not how it works. I, I set a precedent <laughs> once by doing that and you cried the next time we had a barbecue and I didn't have one for you so I had to go and print one off from with clip art on it. <laughs> Welcome to the barbecue what, certificate. Some gold stickers I mean, on it. Yeah, the crying was just... That was a coincidence, Jess. It wasn't, Matt. You was you was throwing you you threw yourself down on the ground. You were stomping your legs and you were screaming about. You were flailing, yeah. You were screaming. Well, this no, is about the lack of certificate. Yeah, but that was a that was a quote. coincidence. What what uh, what certificate were you talking about then? Oh, I mean, I was just I was just making noises, and it just coincidentally <laughs> formed right, words right. that said those things. Well, you'd never get that from David Attenborough, is what I'm saying. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a one in a billion chance. Never. You could, if you followed me around with a camera, David Amber, if you're listening, you probably are, you bloody arrogant c <laughs> <laughs> Oh, what is happening? <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right, okay, we get it. You hate David Attenborough. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really a... finished talking about him. <laughs> you piece of work. <laughs> Nah, he's, he's all right. He's, all right. <laughs> he's got some issues, obviously. He's, he's got 32 it. degrees, mate. He was also... He was is, also is, is there any downside to him? He does seem no. like a pretty good guy. There's no downside. He's wow. A, he's a majestic human. God. He was knighted in 1985. That's when he became Sir David Attenborough. Are you a Sir Matthew? No, you're not. He was named... I'm not even letting you... One respond. of those certificates no. you gave me said... I was. No, it said prince. It said you're a little prince boy. <laughs> My little prince Maddie, it little said. Little prince Maddie. The other day I went and had got some shoes and the guy said, excuse me, sir, do you want to try on a pair? Huh? <laughs> so who's not a sir now? <laughs> Fuckhead. Do, do you know what that sounded like? In that scenario, it sounded like you were walking around a shoe shop. You tried on the one that's on display and the guy came over and said, um, excuse me, sir, would you like a pair? It's weird that you want one. Yeah, no. no. No, I'd like one. And then you called a salesperson a fuckhead. <laughs> um, I've gone off the rails lately. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. Your language is unacceptable. unacceptable. I'm really sorry about the language today. I'll be back on track next week. Bullshit. Um, Atma was named the most trusted celebrity in the UK in a 2006 Reader's Digest poll. I, I like just think that's really most cute. Most trusted. They love to him. do what? To pick up your kids? Just to be trusted. home alone with? Anything. He's trustworthy. With his secrets? Trust with his secrets. Yeah, all Trust right. With David, his... 
Uh, here are my financial details. Yeah, here is my card. My pin my number pin is triple three seven. Help yourself. Help yourself. <laughs> I'm sure but you need. You it. won't. You won't though, because you t- I trust you. I yeah. trust you not. Please look after my infant. Thank you. <laughs> Here's a <laughs> dear David Edinburgh. Here is my infant in a basket at your doorstep. Please look after. I'll be back yeah, at but... four. <laughs> Here is a DVD of me engaging in a sexual act that I want no one to see. <laughs> I trust you not to watch this. <laughs> hmm. I'll be back next weekend and I reckon you'll still be able to look me in the eye. Mm. Mm. Better than the cloud, I reckon. Don't you reckon? Ah, oh, but yeah. We well. should store everything in David Attenborough. <laughs> He's so trustworthy. He's packing up his arsehole. Yeah. <laughs> Another callback. You can't say that about David. <laughs> He was also, in 2007, he won the Culture Show's Living Icon Award. So he's also a living icon, apparently. He, he is. Yeah, he's a, he's a national a national treasure. He's been uh, named among the 100 Greatest Britons in a 2002 BBC poll and is one of the top 10 heroes of our time, according to New Statesman magazine, which is kind of cool. Um, in September 2009, London's Natural History Museum opened the Attenborough Studio is pretty cool which is part of its darwin center development so um he's got he's got a studio named after him which is kind of cool that's real cool i mean i did just carve in the jess perkins podcast studio into the wall here but mm. and you will be paying for that damage and nobody came to the ribbon cutting ceremony even though i sent you all an eve light mm. well if you'd made it a barbecue matt would have been there <laughs> yes Except where's my is... certificate come on jess don't make this about you what are you buddy david attenborough or something <laughs> This is a this is a good one. This is quite a recent one that you may you may remember. In May 2016, so just a few months ago, it was announced that the British Polar Research Ship will be named the RRS Sir David Attenborough in his honour. That's right. While, I- ignoring. Oh, no, that's, that's it. While an internet poll suggesting the name of the ship had the most votes for Boaty McBoatface, because the UK is the best. Um, uh, Science Minister Joe Johnson said there were more suitable names, and the official name was eventually picked up from one of the more favoured choices. So it was still, like, people still voted for it. They thought that was really nice. However, one of its research subs will be named Boaty in recognition of the public vote. Great. Good so, compromise. The RRS Sir David Attenborough, informally known as Boaty McBoatface. Yeah, I'm sure that'll be the nickname for a long time. Yeah. Oh, I wonder if it transfers across to him now, if people start calling him Boaty. Ah, good question. <laughs> we'll soon find out. Um, Attenborough also has the distinction of having at least 15 newly discovered species and fossils being named in his honour, which is pretty cool. Did you say nearly discovered? No, newly. newly. Okay, that makes that does make more sense. <laughs> I reckon there might be a sheep over that hill, and if there is, I'm going to call it David Attenborough. Well, <laughs> back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a weird conversation that guy had with himself. With himself? Mm. <laughs> I'll see that sheep tomorrow. <laughs> Just some lunatic in a field. I'm going to name everything David Attenborough. That tree, David Attenborough. That fence, David Attenborough. Oh, I'm David Attenborough. <laughs> it was David Attenborough. <laughs> yeah, it was. He, he's constantly narrating. <laughs> he can't help it. He narrates his breakfast. <laughs> Do you have a few, uh, a few fun facts? Yay. <laughs> oh, see, I think... Th- they were all was, fun. They were all fun. Like, that was... Well, I can't... What, how fun okay, are they going to be? Then I'll just say I'll continue with the fun facts. No, start them up. Okay. <laughs> Fire it up. He's the only person to have won BAFTAs for programs in each black and white, colour, HD and 3D. Oh, he's won a, a 3D BAFTA. That's kind of cool, isn't it? 3D BAFTA. Well, no, at the, I'm assuming because it's a, a physical award, yes, it would be 3D. But it's for a, a television program in 3D. What a guy. What a guy. In 2002, he was named among... No, nope, I already said that he one. He was named a mung. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fun fact. Someone online called him a mung. What does that even mean? <laughs> I think they misspelled. <laughs> um, during World War Two, through a British charitable program known as Kinder Transport. His parents also fostered two Jewish re- refugee girls. Um, and one of his adoptive sisters gave him a piece of amber filled with prehistoric creatures. <gasps> and some 50 years later, it would be the focus of his program, the Amber Time Machine. That is cool, but also the inspiration. Yeah, Jurassic Park. His, br- his brother's park. Ripped it <laughs> yeah. off. His brother ripped him off. His brother ripped him off, then gave the idea to Michael Crichton, who wrote a book, and then oh. got directed by Steven Spielberg. 
Yeah, no, that's definitely how it worked, though. That's how it worked. Um, his children, do you want to know what they have done? Oh, so was it Susan and what was Susan it? Susan and Robert. Susan was is a former primary school headmistress, so she was a teacher. <laughs> you better say former prime minister. What? <laughs> how did you not hear? Um, but Robert is a senior lecturer in bioanthropology for the School of Archaeology and Anthropology at the Australian National University in Canberra. Oh. What? He teaches here. And um, is he, Attenborough, obviously, is his surname? Well, yeah. And I, my uncle works at ANU and I was like, can you please look up Robert Attenborough? What does your uncle do there? I do not know his official title, but he works in like the School of Sciences as well. Does he like some sort of an academic? He yeah. cleans the Johns with his teeth. <laughs> How dare you? He is what? Oh, he's what very is, high is that up. To clean is what a thing of with his teeth. Like what? Some kind uh, all of, of a sudden, all of a sudden, cleaning. Is my uncle Jeff teeth? an animal? You. Fuck. I didn't suggest that. Jess? Let me move on. I can't believe that you're. And we'll fight this outside. Well, this you're... is disappointing. I thought you were open-minded. You're a real cheekster, Matt. A real cheekster. Thank you, Dave. That is a word. Enough of this gimmickry. <laughs> <laughs> and just to finish on, um, uh, it's just another nice quote from him that I really like. Uh, he was uh, he had a pacemaker fitted in June 2013. He is 90 now. Right? So that he was 87 when he got he's a pacemaker. In such good nick. Actually, he's the same age as my grandpa and your grandpa. Then my grandma. Grandma, right? That's right. But it, she is in. She's fit, but she couldn't, you know, still host TV shows. Yeah, oh, my, amazing. my grandpa, um, both my grandparents are in um, very good health, but yeah, they, they stay home a lot now. Yeah. Because they're 90. Yeah. You know, that's totally fine. Anyway. Yeah, they've earned the right. So he had a pacemaker fitted in, uh, in June 2013, and in September, uh, in an interview, he said, if I was earning my money by hewing coal, I would be very glad indeed to stop. But I'm not. I'm swanning around the world <laughs> looking at the, mo- at the most fabulously interesting things. Such good fortune. Ah, <laughs> oh, he just loves his job. He loves it and he's really grateful for it. I think that's really lovely. So that gentleman is my... I finish every topic with, and that gentleman <laughs> is my report on David, David Attenborough. Attenborough. Thank you. I will now no take report. questions. <laughs> oh, okay. No questions. Oh, God, please don't ask questions. No, Dave will for some reason. <laughs> Dave, um, how long does it take you to hmm? look that good in the morning? Wow. About one hour. That was a turn I was not expecting. Yeah. I'm glad it went that way because I didn't know how long you're going to, I didn't know what you're going to ask me about. We're done. That was a fantastic report about a fantastic man. <laughs> Yeah. David Attenborough, he's just a cool guy. Cool dude. I'm a I fan. think we talked about um, celebrity passings and things like that. When, it, um, you know, knock on wood, he eventually does go. I think that will probably be the biggest outpouring. Yeah, that'll be huge. I can't think of anyone else. That, it's really awful that to would, think like that, isn't it? It is. But I think it's a sign of respect. It'll he's done so loss. much. I, re- yeah. I reckon he's almost closer to the end than he is to the beginning. Dave? So. <laughs> but yes, that was a great report. Thank you very much for that. No, Dave, thank you for your friendship and your company. And thank you to Andy, our friend. Yeah. Andy Matthews, and listener for suggesting that topic. I think that was... Uh, Andy's made a couple of suggestions, and I think that was the first one that we've uh, that we've reported on, if I'm not wrong. So... Um, that is a fact. That is a fact. Thank Ma- you. Matt, the master of the hat. Thank you, Andrew, for that. Much appreciated. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> oh... <laughs> And to all a good night. I I'm genuinely going to go to bed as okay. soon as I can. Fair enough. Yep, I think that you definitely need to do that, Matt. But uh, thanks for listening, everyone. If you want to, uh, us to do your t- uh, a topic, your topic, of your choosing, your suggestion, please tweet us in at do go on pod. Email us, do go on pod at gmail dot com. Mm-hmm. I've washed my teeth. <laughs> um, uh, Facebook, all that kind of stuff. You can get in contact. And yeah, yeah, suggest your things and uh, tell your friends. I th- honestly think the way that we're getting out there and we get a little bit more, you know, our listeners grow every week. I think it's just because you guys are telling people that like podcasts to give ours a go. This <laughs> week's hashtag, of course, is uh, hashtag show us your teeth uh, with a photo <laughs> of you showing us your teeth. That is a brilliant We want to know if your teeth are too big for the BBC in the yeah. 1950s. Show us your teeth and we'll tell you if they're too big yeah. or not. <laughs> we'll give you some tweet, uh, some f- teeth feedback. Some tweet back. Some tweet back about your teeth. Some tweet back. <laughs> hashtag <laughs> tweet. <laughs> That sounds strangely dirty. It doesn't tweet. That's very close to queef. That's why. <laughs> show us your tweet. <laughs> Gross. But yes, show us your tweet. Great. And we'll let you know what we we'll think let of you know. your teeth. 
we will judge you possibly possibly harshly. So we'll make... also should we also tweet pictures of our teeth then? I don't have great teeth, so probably not. <laughs> That's so mean. We're telling them to. Sit. No, you got you guys have got lovely teeth. Good on you. Thanks, man. I had Thanks, razors. Man. Mine are all Brazers. right up top, but they take a pretty nasty turn down down below. Do they? I can't see them from here. They look fine. You're showing me your beard. <laughs> all right. Uh, so thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back next week with another report. And until then, yeah. Jess is going to be laughing her head off, I imagine. That's what I do. That's what you do. Matt's going to be in bed probably for a week. Oh, man. I'm so tired. I haven't and- slept since last week's episode, basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You totally haven't. I partied all week long. Right. Had a couple of cocktails. I'm going to go have a simian sling and we'll be back next week. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Later. Simian sling sounds like a euphemism for um, speedos. I'm going to jump in with simian sling and 250 laps. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>